They're a leader in natural pet food because the best dog ever deserves the best food ever. If you open up a can of Merrick, uh, it smells like real food because that's what it is. It's real wholesome food that your dog is going to love. Now, in the course of our program, they're going to be um, we're going to be talking. They're promoting their Merrick uh, Power Bites, which is a new uh, program. They have a wide variety of dry and wet cat and dog food. You can get it at Petco or many pet independent specialty stores. Um, the recipes are made with USDA inspected deboned meat as the first ingredient and the freshest produce. It's made in the USA with no ingredients from China whatsoever. And in 2014, Merican introduced the new grain-free, gluten-free dog treats. And I have to tell you, my dog Kalba, she loves them. So folks, they're going to be giving away in the course of our program, we're going to be asking you a question. And the first person to answer the question will win four bags of Merrick Power Bites, one in each flavor. Plus, Merrick will donate four bags to a rescue of your choice. Uh, make sure to follow Merrick on uh, Facebook.com Merrick Pet Care and follow them on, on Twitter and Instagram. So we'll be back to pick a winner later on, but right now we're going to be introducing our trainer today and we're in for a really interesting program now don't go anywhere because there's so much information that you guys are going to learn plus 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 we will get to your questions so in the course of the presentation if you have a question go ahead and type it in over on the right hand side and uh, and we will answer it uh, probably later on in the program. And remember, make sure to be the first to answer the question correctly. Now, I have to warn you that people here on we have the smartest listened listeners at our Doggington University, and so you got to be quick on the keyboard to type in your answer. Here we go, folks. Let's introduce our trainer today. Kevin Dugan is a reward-based certified professional dog trainer. His mission is to build positive relationships between people and their canine companions. He's been training dogs for about five years, and many of you know him through his popular Ask the Trainer column on the Doggington Post. Kevin believes you can successfully train any dog using clear communication and trust Never fear or pain. So right now, stand with, stay with us. I'm going to switch things over to Kevin. Make Kevin the presenter. Kevin, you'll show your screen, and away we go. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Perfect. So I want to start off by thanking Merrick Pet Care and Dog into Post, and I want to thank you know everybody for attending. This is going to be a lot of fun, give you a lot of good information here. Uh, once again, my name is Kevin Duggan from All Dogs Go to Kevin, and as Harlan said, kind of my slogan or mission statement is building positive relationships between humans and their canine companions. Um, today's, today's topic is treats to solve common behavior problems uh, presented by me. So we're going to get started. So just quick, quickly about me, um, once again, my name is Kevin. I am the owner of All Dogs Go to Kevin in Kent, Ohio, which is uh, northeast Ohio in the United States, kind of between Cleveland and Akron. I am a certified trainer through the Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers. Uh, just real quick on that, dog training is an unregulated industry. Uh, so basically anybody can call themselves a dog trainer. Is a certification everything? No, it is not, but it's something... It's not a bad thing to look for when you're hiring a trainer. It shows that they've um, at least put some sort of formal education into the into learning what they want to do and you know helping people. So that's something to kind of look for. Um, I'm also a canine good citizen evaluator, and what that is is basically the AKC has a certification process for dogs that deems them good citizens or canine good citizens. 
So it, that just means your dog can go out in public and basically maintain itself. So it can you can cue your dog to leave things if something is dropped on the street. You can pass other people, other dogs, without your dog uh, going toward that dog or person. Basically just saying your dog is well-behaved. And that's kind of a cool little certification that it's fun to work towards um, with your dog. Also, as Harlan mentioned, I'm an author for the Dog in the Post. I have a column that I do a lot of Q&A on. I also do a couple pieces here and there where I just kind of share my views about dog training or things that I find are helpful in dog training. Um, just real quick, in regards to my business, I do in-home training. I, uh, I help with normal kind of basic manners all the way up to, you know, behavioral issues like aggressiveness issues, anxieties, etc. So if you're, in, if you're in Northeast Ohio, here I am. <laughs> but and also I just looked at a facility today, so I might be doing some group classes as well, but that's enough about me. I just wanted to kind of brief you guys real quick. Um, in the picture that you see on your screen is me and my dog, V, who is uh, posing like a star there. So moving on to the next slide, what we have is I'm going to kind of jump right into it. You know, the, the main word is treats, you know, treats for solving common behavioral problems. So I want to start off by talking about what makes a good treat for training. Um, once again, we have a picture here of my dog uh, with a couple of Merrick's Power Bites, the, uh, the turducken recipe that is kind of bouncing on his face there. What I like about these, they kind of fit some of my bullet points here, or actually they fit all of my bullet points. They are soft, they are chewy, which that's almost the same thing, but I mean, I kind of use two words there on purpose. Um, they're small and, well, I didn't taste them, but my dog tastes them, and a lot of dogs I've worked with have tasted them, and they find them quite tasty. They do smell good. I, I'll say that as much, but I, I didn't put them in my mouth. Um, they're made in the USA, and what is also important, and this I know there's people from around the world listening to this, but this is going to kind of be specifically toward um, United States people. It's important to know where your ingredients are coming from for your treats. Just because something says made in U made in the USA doesn't necessarily mean the ingredients are coming from the United States. Um, what companies will do is they will get their ingredients from other places. They will then put them together, put the treat together or the food together in the United States, and they'll say made in the USA. Well, technically, they're not lying. It was made in the USA, but what we need to look for is USA sourced. So the ingredients are sourced from the United States. Um, if you're in another country, kind of you know, play play by those rules. You know, make sure it's safe. Uh, I don't know if there have been problems in other countries as there have been here, but basically a lot of companies in the U.S. have been buying ingredients from, you know, cheap ingredients from uh, China, resulting in a lot of sick dogs. So I don't know if you guys are having that problem overseas or not. But So kind of look for those things if you are in the United States, um, you know, made with all natural ingredients. We want to try to avoid, you know, anything artificial. Um, I like to avoid, like, sugar, too. Most treats, you know, most dogs don't need extra sugar in their diet, so kind of avoid that as well. But in a quick nutshell, those are things that make for a good training treat. And this is important because you put all these things together. It is important because when we're training dogs with treats, we want to give them something that they can quickly basically get down the hatch and move on to the next thing. So when it's soft, chewy, small, and tasty, the dog's maybe going to give it one or two chews and it's going to be gone, whereas if we're using something harder and a little on the larger side, what's going to end up happening is the dog is going to chew it, chew it, chew it, probably drop some pieces, then pick up those pieces, chew it, chew it, and it's going to take a while. So it take, it's going to take you a lot of time in between repetitions of what you're trying to train. So, hey, I can hear somebody in the background over there, just to give you a heads up. Um, I don't know who it is, but I can hear some noise in the Yes, that's 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 Carl, but chewing on her bone. Okay. Whenever she knows that I'm on the <laughs> phone, she comes over and um, and does what she can to disrupt things. <laughs> she sees me in my webinar chair, so I'm going to flip off my mic, but okay, I'm going to be here. I just want to make sure. And you might hear my dog in the background on occasion. He's soundly sleeping right now in the sun, but who knows? We have some thunderstorms maybe scheduled, so who knows what will happen. But anyway. So those are just some quick bullet points. We want to find something that the dog can, can chew and or, uh, just swallow down pretty quickly so we can move on to the next thing uh, and just get those repetitions, repetitions in quickly. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, you know, what makes a good treat for training. So we're going to move on to the next slide. I figured it was a good thing to explain why treats are used. You know, why are they used? What are they used for? So I have a little picture here that I got from doggydrawings.net. Um, it just gives a brief little uh, kind of showing of what it means. I'm going to describe it right now anyway. 
Most of you, if not all of you, have probably heard the terminology positive reinforcement. Uh, I just want to actually explain what positive reinforcement is. Uh, you know, when you hear positive reinforcement, you just think treats, or you think, you know, probably just treats is what most people kind of think. And when you hear, hear the term positive right there, your first thing you kind of think of, or at least what I hear from most people, is positive meaning good, so good things happen. But actually, when you get into operant conditioning and the four uh, the four boxes, if you will. We have basically we have positive reinforcement, we have negative reinforcement, we have positive punishment, and we have negative punishment. So when we're talking about these four quadrants, when we say positive, we mean the addition of something. So instead of thinking, hey, good things, or instead of thinking like positive meaning good, we want to think of positive meaning the addition of something. Um, and then in this sense, we're we're going to talk about reinforcement. And what reinforcement means is getting a behavior to happen again, or increasing the chances of that behavior happening again or increasing the likelihood of that behavior happening again. So positive reinforcement means the basically when the dog does a behavior, and I'll just use the example of sitting. So I ask my dog to sit, dog sits, I then give him a treat. What I just did was positively reinforce the behavior of sitting. So what that means is there's a very good chance the next time I ask my dog to sit that he will sit because of the positive reinforcement. Um, humans, let me think of a quick human example. I mean, you can really, you know, you go to work and you get paid. That's basically positive reinforcement. You know, if you're doing something, something af after you do that, something good happens. It makes you very likely to do that behavior again. So that's really quickly in a nutshell. That's what's what positive reinforcement is. Um, what you know, why we use positive reinforcement is because science is telling us that it is the best way to teach our dog new behaviors and to really get those behaviors built into their system and build those habits. So. The cool thing about positive reinforcement too is not only does it make the behavior likely to happen again, but it makes the behavior likely to happen again even stronger. So with even more ferociousness, that's not a good adjective, but you know, even stronger. So for instance, if, um, if if you ask your dog to sit and your dog does like a kind of like an ant kind of sit, it sits really slowly, you give him a treat. Well, the next time you ask your dog to sit, the dog's very likely to sit right down. And this kind of goes with problem behaviors too, and, and we're going to be talking about specifically four different problem behaviors. And excuse me, I'm going to be talking about how you know reinforcement of behaviors plays a big uh, factor in why those unwanted behaviors are happening. But so why are they used? They're used for positive reinforcement, and just like I described, you know, when we use positive reinforcement, it makes the dog very likely to do that behavior again, and it's very likely that the behavior is going to get stronger and stronger. Um, the next bullet point is dogs will work to receive one. And basically, kind of like the example I just gave a few minutes ago or a few seconds ago, it's like working for a paycheck. We go to work to get paid. Well, I mean, depending on the job, you know, but overall we go to work to get paid. If we weren't getting paid, a lot of us wouldn't go to work. And if we still went to work, we probably wouldn't work all that hard because we're just going to go through the motions. So we can get a lot, of, a lot out of our dogs by paying them for working. The next bullet point I want to point out, and it's very simple, but it's fun. It's simply put like that. You can have fun with this. I am what is referred to as a crossover trainer. And what that means is I used to start off training dogs, or when I started off training dogs, I did a very physical, very hands-on style of training, didn't use any treats. I used um, you know, force. I used uh, devices that would get the dog to do it because I was basically hurting the dog or scaring the dog. I know that sounds horrible, but that's, that's what I was doing. Once I got into the certification process that I went through, I learned how dogs learn, and I started understanding how positive reinforcement works, and I switched completely. When I was working with my dog initially, I didn't have any fun doing it. I was doing it because it was like a chore. Now the way I train dogs is fun. I enjoy working with my dog. All my clients, all my clients enjoy working with their dogs because of the way that I have them set up to do it. So quite simply, it's fun. And the way that I do training, kind of like I just mentioned, is I don't want it to be a chore because if it's a chore, let's be realistic. Nobody wants to do chores, but if we can make it fun, if we can make training a game, well, guess what? The human's going to want to do it, and so is the dog. So it's fun. I'm just going to end on that note because I'll keep talking about how much fun I have training dogs. But anywho, um, and then lastly, the next bullet point or the last bullet point I want to point out is they can be paired with a word to increase the value of that word. Um, I'm not sure, but... It, Basically, the term is classical conditioning. I'm not going to get into classical conditioning too much during this webinar. 
Um, in one week, we're doing another webinar called uh, It's Treats for Training Rescue Dogs. I'm going to get into classical conditioning and counter conditioning there. But just real quick, I pair words and or I'll pair a clicker with treats. And what that does is when you do something right before giving the dog a treat, it starts to anticipate that that thing means that a treat is on its way. I use the term good boy or good girl when I'm working with a dog. So, for instance, I say sit, dog sits, I say good boy. And with repetition, the dog knows, okay, I heard good boy. I know good things are, are, are on their way. Um, when I'm working with dogs that are having issues out in the public, one of the goals is my one of my goals is to get the dog to look at the thing that might be frustrating it. And when it looks, my goal is to tell it good boy for looking and not reacting. So it's kind of cool. What I'll do is I'll get the dog to look. As soon as the dog looks, I say good boy. And the dog will just turn its head right away to me because it knows what it means, meaning, hey, I'm gonna get a treat for that. But where I'm going with this is we can pair, like just like I said, we can pair these treats, we can pair the word with the treats. I mean, I'm sure all of you have some sort of phrase or some sort of word that you can say to your dog to get them to get excited. Um, you know, want to go for a walk, um, you want to eat, et cetera, et cetera. If I look at my dog and say you want to, and I could kind of end it there, his ears perk up. And in fact, he just woke up and put his head off the ground when I said that. So that's just kind of classical conditioning 101. We can use that to our advantage when we're training with treats. Um, Quick summary, positive reinforcement, gets the dog to do things. Uh, you know what, I'm not going to summarize it. I'll summarize it at the end because I'm talking a lot on this slide and we have limited time, so just going to keep the party going here. Uh, the next thing, uh, just this slide here real quick, just highlighting the common problem behaviors or common behavior, common behavior problems that I'm going to be addressing today. I picked four very common ones that a lot of people are having issues with, so jumping, whether it's on the owner or whether it's on the guest. Pulling on leash, um, yeah, that's just going to be the owner most likely. Uh, soiling in the house and not coming when called. I couldn't find a better title for not coming when called. You could say running away. You could say ignoring the owner, however you want to call it. But So those are the four that we're going to be specifically talking about. Here I have a picture of my dog jumping on me, and as I say, you know, he's, not, he's jumping on me. He's not dancing with me. That might be a lie. I might have picked him up, and we might have been doing that. But oh well, moving on. So we're going to jump right into jumping. Hey, that was a good pun right there. Jumping. So why does it happen? Um, going along the, you know, why do we use treats and all the training and stuff, I use the term, you know, it's fun. Well, why do dogs jump? The first bullet point I decided to put there um, is it's fun. They have fun. I mean, if you look at this dog here, I don't know if it's a Chinese Crested or if it's a, a Zolo. Yeah, that's how you're short. Anyway, but he looks like he's having fun or she. In fact, we got jumping and a little bit of play biting happening here too. I see a finger in the dog's mouth. But quite simply, it's fun. And if it's fun, the dog's going to continue doing it. So, you know, you get home, you walk in the door, your dog's excited, your dog starts jumping on you. It's happy to see you and it's having fun. So that's one reason why it's happening. Along with, its, with it being fun is it's reinforced. So kind of, you know, with the positive reinforcement that we talked about, a few minutes ago, when a dog does a behavior and something good happens during that behavior or directly after that behavior, and the dog and that's something enjoyable, the dog is likely to do that behavior again. So if the dog, if you walk in and the dog jumps on you and it gets enjoyment out of it, its behavior is being reinforced. Either you can look at it as it's reinforcing its own behavior, or you can look at it as you are reinforcing the dog's behavior. Even if you're not doing anything, you still could inadvertently be reinforcing your dog's behavior. Um, so those are two, two reasons there. Uh, the next bullet point I have is that it is often conditioned from a young age. And I just like to point this out. When we get dogs, or let me rephrase that, when we get puppies, you know, they're low to the ground. Oftentimes we're on the ground with them, and our face is, is pretty close to theirs. And I just kind of like to point out that we, in some ways, are conditioning our dogs to want to be by our face, by our face, by our faces, and that could play into this a little bit. Now, I'm not saying don't be on the ground with your puppy. Honestly, that's it's going to be unavoidable. We're going to be on the ground with our puppies, but I'd like to at least point that out, that that could be part of a reason for it. Um, and then the final bullet point there is an appropriate behavior hasn't been taught. So, you know, we haven't taught them what we want them to do. And when we get into why it's happening and when we get into why, you know, how do we solve it, most people's first reactions are to, you know, how do we get this to stop now? What kind of punishment can I use to get the dog to stop this behavior. And some, I'm just going to name off a few punishment methods that I've heard of. Uh, some people are still using these. 
you have um, a common one is where well, you put your knee up and you put your knee into the dog's chest. Another one I've heard of is dog jumps. You grab its front paws and you squeeze its front paws. Another one I've heard is dog jumps. You grab its front paws and you stomp on the dog's back feet. Um, you know, sticking elbows out there, so it headbutts your elbow, you know, hitting the dog, yelling at the dog. These are just examples. Um, these aren't examples approved by me. I don't recommend doing these for a couple reasons. One, a lot of times the punishment that you're trying to use with your dogs in a situation like this, this is going to sound kind of funny, but a lot of times this punishment turns into reinforcement. What I mean by that is these dogs are jumping to get your attention. So you're, you know, you're home, you, you walk in the door, dog starts jumping on you, and it, basically it wants your attention. It's, it's excited to see you. It wants your attention. Well, some dogs will take any attention that they can get, whether it's good attention or whether it's bad attention. So whether you grab the dog and you start you know, scratching its belly when it's jumping up on you, or whether you're putting your knee into its chest or yelling at it or shoving it off of you, either one of those, well, minus the be good attention, but those some of that bad attention could be good enough for your dog to continue to do the behavior. So you could unintentionally be reinforcing your dog's behavior. Even though you're intending for it to be punishment, what you're actually doing is reinforcing the behavior. So think of it that way. I just like to point out things that I don't, you know, quickly don't approve of. Um, and then, yeah, so that, I'm just going to end on that note real quick with that. I'm going to move on to now, you know, how to solve it? How do we solve jumping? The picture that I have chosen here is a client of mine named Gus when he was like eight or nine weeks old or ten weeks old, a little boxer, and probably one of the cuter dogs in the world of puppyhood there, so I had to use it. The reason why I chose this picture though is because he is sitting. Now, what does sitting and jumping have to do with one, of one another? And that's a great question. The thing is, sitting and jumping, they are what, are refer what is referred to as incompatible behaviors. So if your dog is jumping, there's no way that it can be sitting. And if your dog is sitting, there's no way that it can be jumping. So that's why I chose that picture. And I'm going to get into that here in a second. But the full, first bullet point that I have is focus on what you'd like your dog to do instead. So as I mentioned a second ago, most people jump to, how do I get this to stop? What do I have to do to physically stop my dog from jumping? So they want to, like I mentioned, the punishment. But I like to turn the tables and say, OK, well, instead of thinking about punishment, how to get it to stop, Think about what you'd like your dog to do instead. Well, the obvious answer is, well, I want my dog not to jump. Unfortunately, dogs aren't humans, and we can't just say, hey, don't jump on me, which that might work for some humans. Some humans might still jump on anyway. But anyway, so we can't do that. So we have to give them direction. We have to use clear communication, which is the second bullet point there, and give them complete direction on what we would like them to do. This is where the treats are going to come into play. I like and I highly recommend working on a very, very, very strong sit cue to get your dog to stop jumping. So this can work by you walk in, your dog starts jumping on you. You can just cross your arms, look at him, and say sit. And, you know, not that I want you to repeat yourself, but you can repeat yourself if need be. The idea is that, you know, they'll start to sit. Now, if also take into consideration that with all that excitement, it's going to be probably too overwhelming for them to just kind of snap it into, oh, I'm supposed to sit. So don't be afraid to get a treat out and do a lure reward method. Um, and what that is, they just released a video with Merrick teaching how to, how to teach a sit and a lie down with the lure. But what that is, is you get out your treat and you put it right on your dog's nose. I mean, right in their mouth slash nose. And you're going to hold on to it so they can't actually take the treat out of your hand. But you're going to let them lick and nibble on it. And what you're going to do from there, and, and what luring is, is you're basically guiding the dog, the dog's body into a position that you want it to be in. So in order to get a sit, when the dog's standing, I put it right in front of his face. As he's licking, nibbling on it, I start raising it over his head, not too high up, but over his head and back toward his butt. Two things are going to happen. One of two things will happen. He's either going to raise his front legs off the ground to try to follow it, or he's going to lower his back legs, resulting in a sit. Once, you know, if he starts jumping, just pull it away, get him back, uh, get him back on all fours and start over. If he puts his butt down, that's when you're going to add in the reward part of the lure reward. So the lure then turns into a reward. So you, you're in the correct, uh, correct position, here's your reward. So that's a good way to start if your dog is very, very uh, excited. Because some dogs, their ears just aren't working when they're super, super excited. So sometimes you have to take a step back. Even if your dog knows what sit means, you still have to take a step back and go with the lure reward method. And even, not even in jumping situations, but in general, if you're out working with your dog in a different environment that they've never been in, 
and they know how to sit and lie down, but you go to a different environment, it might be too overwhelming and too distracting. You might have to figuratively take a step back and do some luring and some rewarding that way to get them to understand the same behaviors in any environment. But so real quick, um, that's one thing that you can do to teach the incompatible behavior. Another thing that I do, and I intentionally, I have a game plan here, and depending on the size of the dog kind of, you know, will affect this. But one thing I do is when I'm dealing with a really excited dog, I'll get out, you know, a, a reward and put it right in the dog's face, and I will, so the dog knows I have it, I will then kind of cross my arms and just look at the dog. And he's, the dog's going to, I want him to know I have the treat intentionally. So what happens is the dog is then going to look at me and go, well, what do I have to do to get that treat? Dogs that are jumpers, well, their first reaction is going to be to jump. So they're going to jump on you, jump on you. And I just look at them, and I don't say a word. I just let them jump on me, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait. I'm waiting for the dog to put his butt on the ground. So I'm waiting for him to sit. As soon as he sits, I give him a, that reward. I then walk away, and I do the same exact thing. Dog will walk up to me. There's a chance that he might jump on me a couple times, but very quickly, because of the positive reinforcement that we use with the treat, he's going to put his bum on the ground and sit, and then walk away a few steps, and I just keep repeating it. What I like about this is, uh, this is how I create what is referred to as an auto-sit, and what that means is the dog kind of automatically sits. And this gets the dog conditioned to start walking up to people and sitting instead of jumping. Um, I did this with a, uh, the local APL gave me a call the other day, uh, or a couple weeks ago, and, and they said, you know, we have a dog here that's kind of a, I don't want to say a disaster, but she's, we want to know if she's trainable or not. So I go up there and I get her outside in one of the uh, fenced-in little areas, and she is jumping on me like, crazy, I mean, crazy, crazy jumping on me. So I did what I just mentioned. I grabbed out, a tr I grabbed a treat, put it right in her face, and I just crossed my arms, and I waited for her to offer that sit. She jumped on me for a couple seconds. She offered the sit. I rewarded her, took a few steps away. She jumped on me once or twice, sat. I rewarded her, took a few steps away, and she just automatically started sitting, and the jumping completely went away. But So that's a good way to get sitting to start happening, excuse me, happening automatically instead of um, jumping. Now, I choose not to use any words for that. You can say the word sit a couple times in the beginning to give them like a hint to help them out a little bit, but I, I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to let dogs figure things out on their own and then reinforcing those behaviors. So you can, you can try it without. So if your dog's a jumper and you get home from work or something, set it up so that you can have some treats maybe by your front door or you have brought some with you so that way you have them when you get back. And as soon as you get home, the dog's going to start jumping on you, stick that treat right in his face, and then pull it away and kind of cross your arms and wait for him to offer that sit. The, the treat will work a little bit as a distraction, too. It will give him something to focus on because the dog's focus is already on you because you're so exciting. So, I mean, I love an excited dog when I come home, but I like a dog that kind of controls itself. And depending on the dog, you know, jumping can really hurt somebody. If, you're, if you have a dog that you have a guest come over and that guest is a child or, like, a senior citizen or just a smaller person in general – and you have a decent-sized dog, there's a great chance that your dog could hurt them, and let's face it, we don't want that. So, um, But clear communication is key. I, you know, I let the dog know, hey, you're doing the right thing. Hey, that's incorrect. Try something else. Another very, very, very important thing is we need to ensure, I, I think I spelled that right, ensure, it might be ensure, I think I'm, I think I'm good there, ensure unwanted behavior isn't re reinforced. And I mentioned briefly in, in the previous slide, we can unintentionally reinforce behavior, meaning, you know, by pushing them off or yelling at them, that could be reinforcement. What I see a lot of people do, too, is they know that jumping is a problem, but they don't put this, these two and two together here, and I'm going to help you put it together. Really, any time that a dog has four feet off, any time the dog doesn't have four feet on the ground, I consider that jumping. So if the dog walks up to me and puts a paw on me, which is then followed by another paw, and it's kind of like standing, leaning up against me, I have to consider that to be a jump because and it's so hard for them to differentiate early on. We need to eliminate it all together, in my opinion. We need to eliminate it all together in the beginning. So if your dog kind of puts two feet on, on you and starts crawling up on you like that, just gently push them off. And I mean just very gently, just the system getting back to the ground. And then you can start reinforcing the behavior of um, sitting and they can get the attention that way. Worst case scenario, if you want your dog to be on you, invite them to jump up on the couch or something next to you and then they can come on you that way. Whatever you do though, don't allow them to jump directly on you. Um, and also we have to make sure that no friends or, or family are reinforcing this behavior because let me tell you, one person reinforcing this behavior is enough to make this behavior always there. So if you have that one person that comes in your door and says, oh it's okay, this dog can jump on me, well guess what? Your dog is probably always going to be a jumper. 
Um, and because of that, when I mentioned that positive reinforcement, the dog does a behavior and gets enjoyment out of it, the dog is very likely to do that behavior again. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much more about jumping. I'm going to say a couple more things here. Uh, one thing I like to teach dogs is I like to give them a cue. So what a lot of people, to get a dog to jump on them, they slap their chest and they say, come on up, you know, something along those lines. What I like to do is I'll walk up to a dog and I'll do those motions, and basically I'm trying to get him to jump on me. And if he jumps on me, I don't give him a reward. But when I do it again, and maybe I do it a little less uh, inviting, so I'll just kind of gently say, come on up, jump on me. And if he doesn't jump, I say, good boy, and I reward that behavior. Sounds a little confusing, but basically what I'm doing is I'm training I'm training the dog that when someone slaps its chest, slaps their chest and says, come on, jump on me, what that actually means is it's a cue for you to stay in your sitting position or not jump. So if you slap your chest and say, come on up, and the dog stays down, you say, good boy, and you reward. Or if you're using a clicker, you click and treat. Um, but at, you know everything that I'm saying here, it all is re um, revolving around the treats, which is the positive reinforcement, which is going to get us the behavior we're looking for. At the very final bullet point I have down there at the bottom is use a management device. So what I mean by that is, say you have a guest coming over, and your dog is currently free roam of the house. The guest comes in, your dog jumps all over the guest. Okay, now what do we do? Well, you know that's tough. You could try to grab your dog by the collar or something. It's just so chaotic. My advice is use a leash. I do a little system. Well, I'm not gonna have time for it, but I teach a dog how to walk up and sit in front of a in front of a human. Uh, I do that by using the lure reward method, um, and I teach that with two people. I do it strictly with training sessions. So the the person has the dog on leash. They look at the other person. The other um, excuse me. They look at the dog. They tell the dog to go say hi. That means the dog walks up to the other person. The other person lures them to a sit. That's kind of I have a video on that. I'll, I'll kind of tell you guys about it at the end. But ultimately, I want to give the dog the opportunity to greet the guests. And if it makes the right decision, guess what? It gets to hang out with the guest. We can use a treat, so the dog walks up to the guest, the guest gives him a treat, starts petting the dog, hey, you're doing the right thing. What I like about using this management system, though, is if the dog takes one step off the ground, what we can do is just gently pull him away. Um, and we can even try to lure him away, depending on their excitement level they might not take. But we can get him away, get a little bit of distance, maybe 10, 15 seconds, then we let them try to greet the guest again. And I will do this as many times as I need to before, in order to get that dog to not jump on the guest. So it might take five repetitions, it might take 10 repetitions, but the overall goal is you do not let the dog jump on the guest. You pull him away with the leash if he starts to. So that gives you a management device. I don't have time to cover all these, but there's also games called Four on the Floor where you tether the dog to something sturdy. That gives you a chance to walk away. So what you do is you create a little distance. You walk up to the, to the dog. The dog is tethered to it. If the dog stays in a sitting or even a standing position and doesn't jump, the dog receives a treat, as in the positive reinforcement. And it also receives the attention it's looking for, which is, you know, comes in the form of petting or just the attention. The cool thing is if the dog jumps, you are then able to walk away. The dog cannot follow you because it's tethered behind. This is an example of what's referred to as negative punishment or taking something away that the dog is enjoying. Uh, but so quickly, jumping in a nutshell, I'm just going to sum this up. What we want to do is we never want to reward the behavior of jumping. We want to teach an incompatible behavior, which is sitting. I, sitting is just a great go-to move. We want to make sure that no one's reinforcing the jumping, and I mean nobody that, that needs to be completely cut out. Make sure that you know we're not unintentionally reinforcing it, meaning we're not letting the dog jump on us and we're petting it or anything. Clearly communicate. I know this can be frustrating. Yelling isn't going to make anything better. It's just going to make you more frustrated, and yelling is not clear communication of the dog. It's clear speak clearly to the dog. Um, even though they don't understand every word of English, you're going to have a lot more success speaking clearly than you are if you start yelling. And use lots of rewards. Those rewards, you know, those treats as rewards are going to get you the behavior you're looking for. Remember that jumping for a lot of dogs is a go-to move. It's like embedded in their brains. They've learned it. They love it so much that it's the first thing they do. So we need to kind of get them to switch over to sitting is the, the new go-to move. Uh, so... That's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, there's probably more things that I, well, there's definitely more things I could say, but I'm just going to move on to the next thing because time constraints and everything like that. And you probably just heard my dog shaking around. He's up and moving now. So moving on to the next problem behavior, um, pulling on leash. I want to say one last thing about the jumping. I do have a really, I have a couple of good videos on jumping on my YouTube channel, which I'll plug at the end, so you guys can take a look at some videos to get visuals of what I'm saying. Uh, the next one we're going to be talking about is another common uh, problem behavior, which is pulling on leash. 
So I just kind of titled it, Why Does It Happen? Uh, and it happens for a lot of the same reasons that jumping happens. Uh, the main one I like to point out is that it's reinforced. And what that means is the dog does a behavior, you know, we talk about positive reinforcement, the dog does a behavior and then gets something it enjoys. So in this case, and we have a picture of a, of a Belgian here, and what it's doing is it's pulling, and what it's going to pull to is something that it wants to get to. So we're just going to use a tree as an example. So say this dog is pulling to a tree, what happens next? Well, the dog gets to the tree, which is what it wanted. So that behavior is then reinforced. And this is kind of why it happens, one of the reasons why it happens in a nutshell, the dog learns that it gets what it wants via pulling. You know, there's myths out there that um, the dog thinks it's in charge, or they, they might even say that it's dominating you or something like that. I'm going to kind of dispel those myths and rumors right now. Um, pulling happens because it's reinforced. It also happens because of this term called opposition reflex. Opposition reflex is when, or I'm just going to use the dog as the example, when the dog feels pressure or force, it wants to fight that force or pressure. So in this case, when the dog feels tension on the leash, it wants to oppose that tension. It wants to fight it, which causes pulling. Uh, the sled dogs do a great, great job of this. They feel it and they pull against it, and they're doing their job there. Uh, so it's reinforced, and we have opposition reflex. You know, if you if your dog is standing on all fours and you you know take your hand on its head and gently push down, the dog's gonna in most cases push its head back up. That's opposition reflex. If you go to push the dog's butt down, it's probably gonna fight it and push back up. That's opposition reflex. So that's just a normal thing, and that's part of the reason why it happens. Um, simply put, too, uh, most dogs walk faster than humans. I mean, unless you have a small dog that has little tiny legs. You know, like the dog in the picture, that's probably a 45, 50, 60 pound dog with, you know, legs that are decent length. Natural stride for that dog is going to be faster than us humans, unless you're like a power walker by a trade or something. So we have to keep that in mind. So we're kind of fighting that. And also remember, it's very unnatural for a dog to be on leash. If dogs were in the wild, they wouldn't be leashed. So this is a very foreign object for them. Um, another bullet point that I have at the, at the bottom is it's learned from the start. And what I mean by that is most of us, we get new dogs, we get puppies, um, or, you know, even we, get, we, go to the, we go to the shelter and get an awesome rescue dog, and we put the leash on them, and the first thing they start doing is pulling, and we just get dragged behind them. This is learned from the very beginning, and I think puppies, it's the worst to do it with because they, we have the perfect opportunity with a puppy to teach them that pulling is something that isn't there. Pulling is non-existent because if we never let them pull, they'll never learn that it's a possibility. So with puppies, that's something that you definitely don't want um, to happen at all. But once again, it's learned from the start. So we need to be kind of consistent and persistent and not allow it to happen at all. Um, that's why it happens. And it's just kind of in a nutshell. And there, you know, there's other reasons too, but it's not, it's not because the dog thinks it's in charge. It's because the dog, you know, has learned that benefits come from pulling on leash. Once again, it's the example of that positive reinforcement. Dog does behavior, dog gets enjoyment out of that behavior, or something good comes from that behavior. And guess what? Dog is likely to do that behavior again. And as I mentioned earlier, that behavior is likely to get stronger, meaning he's going to pull harder and harder. And with that opposition reflex, too, when they feel that tension, it causes them to pull harder and harder. I've worked with a lot of big dogs, and I'll go out there holding onto the leash with one hand, and the owners are looking at me like, they're, like I'm crazy because they're like, well, it takes two of us to hold onto this dog. And I'm like, well, don't worry. I'm not going to actually let the dog pull me, so I'm not going to need that much strength to stop the dog. It's when you let the dog start pulling that it gets out of control and out of control. So that's kind of, you know, in a nutshell, though, why it's happening. So we're going to move on to how to solve it. Yes, that is a tree and walker coonhound walking next to me on a loose leash, and they said it couldn't be done. Um, so, yeah, you know, you, when you get into hound dogs, they say it's nearly impossible to teach them to walk on a loose leash. So I figured I'd put that in there. But my first rule, and you can see this is a top bullet point here, is never allow the dog to move forward when leash is tight. As I mentioned, that oppositional reflex, as soon as that leash tightens, it's going to cause them to want to pull further and further. And also, as soon as we allow them to keep taking steps towards something that they want when that leash is tight, we are then reinforcing the behavior. Our job is to get that leash to be loose like it is in this picture and then use our treats to reward that behavior. I do, you know, ultimately, we just want to teach the dog, hey, Walking on a loose leash equals getting what you want. Walking with a tight leash does not equal getting what you want. For some dogs, this is going to be very, very difficult in the beginning. So, you know, 
a lot of patience is key here. One of the common questions is, okay, well, I understand the concept, but how do we get that leash to be loose? Well, training sessions is the answer. First things first, we can start off inside our home. We can start off inside the house. We don't have to start off outside. Outside, there's a ton of distractions. Inside, you or I is is or are, whatever. We're going to be the biggest distraction. We're going to have the good stuff. The dog's going to be focused on us. It is a great idea to introduce this behavior inside your home, and I highly recommend using a cue for this behavior. So we say sit to get the dog to sit. I say let's go to get the dog to walk on a loose leash. So I highly recommend doing that because if we practice it inside by saying let's go, as soon as we start going outside, we can start using that same cue to incorporate what we're looking for. Um, and then that will, you know, inside we can then, we'll have a loose leash almost constantly inside the home. We can get plenty of reinforcement in there and then we can start transferring it outside. Realistically, the next step from going inside to outside is we want to go to a boring part of outside. So what I mean is go to the most boring part outside your house that you can find. Maybe it's the backyard, maybe it's the side yard. You want to find a place where there's not many distractions because if you try to go from inside where there's limited distractions to zero distractions and you go out front where you're on the sidewalk like in this picture and you're dealing with squirrels and other dogs and people, you're not going to have much success. You need to do this kind of in increments. But by doing it in increments, you're going to have more success with the loose leash, which will then allow you to reward the dog with the treats when it's walking on that loose leash. And then you can start building that behavior that you're looking for. Uh, my next bullet point is use appropriate equipment. Um, ironically, I'm using a regular collar and a, and a leash here. It's not bad if your dog's walking on a loose leash. If you're doing training with this, I highly recommend not using anything that goes around the dog's neck. Um, the neck is actually quite sensitive area on the dog. I highly recommend using a harness that the leash hooks in the front or even a what's referred to as a freedom harness that has a double leash, one hooks in the front um, on the chest and one hooks above the shoulder blades. And it has one handle but it, ha it forks off into two anchor points. The idea with you know a front hooking harness is if we want to punish our dogs by going the opposite way, and I'm going to explain this here in a second, but if we're going to punish our dogs by going the opposite way of the way they want to go, if we have a leash that's hooked in the front, we can turn them around very easily, whereas if we have a leash that's just on their back, or if we have a leash that's um, just on a collar and it's positioned kind of behind them, they have a lot of leverage to fight us. I want this turnaround to be fluent. I don't want there to be any jerking involved with it or anything like that. The idea behind turning around when, when you're – so the idea of punishment as – turning around as a punishment is we're taking away the way that the dog wants to go. So basically, if you're going to try to pull in this direction, well, the punishment is you don't get to go in that direction. And in fact, you're going to go further away from the way you want to go. The way this works, too, is since you're taking away the direction that the dog wants to go, typically they don't pull the opposite way, which then gives you a perfect opportunity to say, good boy, reward, good boy, reward, good boy, reward for walking – on a loose leash. When they're doing good with that, then what I do is I say, all right, let's go this way. <clears throat> and I invite the dog to go back the way that it wanted to go, which in itself is a reward too. So I'll continue to use treats as a reward, and then I'll also use the way that the dog wants to go as a reward. It's kind of referred to as an environmental reinforcer. But like I said, with this appropriate equipment, I really am not a fan of, of anything that goes around the dog's neck. If we're going to be, if there's going to be any tension on the leash, dogs have very sensitive necks and, you know, collapse their tracheas, they can cut, you know, or we can cut the blood supply off to their brains, or which has been proven to affect their, their vision and their hearing in the long run. So we can do a lot of damage. Um, but, so think of something like an easy walk harness or a freedom harness, or I know there was a webinar recently, um, I think, come on now, the sensation harness. There's, there's a lot of different harnesses out there that will give you this, the control you need um, instead of using something around the dog's neck. So, you know, worst case scenario too, if you have a humongous dog that you physically can't control, they make things like head halters, um, like a gentle leader or like a halty that will kind of work the same way that a horse, um, a horse thing works where you control the head, you control the body. I don't really use those very much, but like if it's somebody that's very small and they have a humongous dog, maybe that's the best tool to teach the loose, le loose leash and then we could get them onto a harness. Um, ironically, I pretty much use a harness with my dog all the time just in the freak accident that I have to, you know, tug him away from something. I don't want to have to pull him from his neck. I want to pull him from his chest. So there, that's that. 
And then, you know, consistency, persistence, and repetition. Like those three words are buzzwords. Consistency is huge. If you continue to let your dog pull on leash, you're never going to have a dog that walks on a loose leash. You have to nip this in the bud completely uh, out with the old habit and with the new habit. So as long as the dog continues to be able to pull on occasion, that's what's – walk and sync harness is the harness that the webinar was on recently. Um, but as long as that old habit's allowed to happen, then it's always going to happen. There is variations to that. I mean, I do have a cue that allows my dog to pull me when we're on rollerblades or something, but – my, my recommendation is when you're trying to teach a new behavior, focus solely on that behavior, and then you can start introducing the opposite on a cue if you want to. But that might be confusing. Long story short, don't reinforce the unwanted behavior. Uh, and then, like I said at the bottom here, do training sessions. Those training sessions are huge. One of the worst mentalities that we can have with our dogs when we're trying to teach a loose leash walk is the mentality that the humans get is, okay, we're going to go for a walk. We're going to get our dog to walk nicely on this walk. If you have that mentality, you're not going to have much success. I really recommend just putting 10, 20 minutes aside each day and start picking a direction to walk in. If your dog starts to pull, just say, nope, start going the other way and start rewarding for it. Don't have a destination in mind. Just practice the actual behavior of loose leash walking. 10, 15-minute training sessions. Um, and if your dog's doing good, then you can start adding in that walk. But as soon as you get the mentality that you're going for a long walk, that's when your frustration is going to start kicking in. That's when you have a tendency to want to start pulling the dog back and start you know, jerking the leash and stuff. Ideally, the leash that we're using is just kind of for backup, or like I said, we're using it as the turnaround method. You don't even have to do a turnaround method. You could just plant your feet, stand there, call the dog back to you, and then try to continue in the same direction. I just have had a lot of success with the turnaround method. And like I said, it's supposed to be a fluent turnaround. It's not no jerking or anything like that. Um, and just to summarize everything real quick, you know, Rewards are where it's at. This is how I teach dogs to walk on a loose leash. When I first got into dog training, I was using chokers, and I, and you know, you can see results with chokers. I'm not going to say you won't, but this is a way that's more fun for the human, more fun for the dog. And personally, I've had better results with using, you know, harnesses, leashes, and treats. So I'm going to stop talking on that note with this. But remember, never allow, allow the dog to move forward when the leash is tight. Reward the dog for the you know, the loose leash, use the appropriate equipment. We don't want to hurt our dogs to get them to listen. We can do it without hurting them or scaring them. Consistency, persistence, and repetition. Don't give up. You need to be more stubborn than your dog, if you will. If your dog's going to keep trying to pull and then you give in, you're never going to have a dog that walks on a loose leash. Um, and then do those training sessions. That's very, very important. So that's kind of it in a summary. I know I'm talking fast. I'm trying to get this all in in the allotted amount of time. So that's kind of, that's two of them. Um, and like I said, once your dog's walking on a loose leash, if you really want to get into it, you can start putting pulling on a cue, like on cue. So, okay, you can pull me. Like I said, I do it with rollerblades on with my dog. And it's a good release for him, but that might not be the best option for, for everybody out there. So keep that in mind. And to go back with the jumping as well, if you want your dog to greet you by jumping into your arms, that's not the end of the world, but I highly recommend eliminating the behavior completely first. Then you can start dabbling with putting it on a cue. But remember, because the dog gets enjoyment out of it, there's a chance that the dog might start doing it on its own, you know, depending on, on how it works. So try, you know, give it a shot. But definitely get it out of the dog system completely before you start uh, putting it on cue. All right. So we're going to move on to the next thing, which is not coming when called. You know, why does this happen? And, you know, I've got a dog running in the street here. I figured that was a fitting picture. Imagine calling that dog. And if that dog doesn't come, well, Unfortunately, bad things can happen. Coming when called, I'm not even going to say can be. I'm going to say it is a life-saving cue. And uh, I say cue, I mean, that's another word for command. I, I like to say cue. So it's a life-saving cue because say your dog's running toward that street. Well, guess what? If we can't call him back to us or we don't have, uh, we'll just say, if we can't call the dog back to us, dogs that enter the road and, you know, you can fill in the blank from there. So it's very important. So why don't dogs come when we ask? Well, other things are more interesting. So dogs outside sniffing flowers, uh, sniffing poop, whatever, sniffing something that the dog enjoys. And we're sitting here saying, come here, come here, come here, Fido. And the dog's like, no, I'm sniffing flowers. I'm sniffing poop. It smells good. Um, why, why else does it happen? Well, the appropriate behavior hasn't been taught yet, which would be the opposite of not coming when called, which would be coming when called. And we're going to get into teaching that here in a second. Uh, a good bullet point here, too, is too much freedom too quickly. So realistically, your dog has no business, no business being outside off leash until we have a reliable coming when called cue down. Look at coming when or look at freedom as a privilege because as soon as 
you know, if you have kids and you give kids a privilege before they've earned it, they usually take advantage of it. Dogs are going to do the same exact thing. As soon as a dog learns that it doesn't have to listen to us when we call it or that, you know, better things happen when we call other than coming to us, we're basically training them not to come when called. So we have to manage that freedom. I don't use any punishment when it comes to this behavior when we're getting into teaching it. So I have to manage what the dog finds enjoyable. And that includes, you know, finding things to sniff, finding things to eat, all that stuff. I have to manage all that and not allow the dog to get it for doing the inappropriate behavior. Um, the final bullet point here is human is unintentionally removing dog from something it is enjoying. In the very beginning, we want our dogs to come every time we call. I get it. That makes sense. I'm with you. But I'm here to tell you that in the very beginning, when we're teaching this word come to our dogs or whatever word you choose, we need the dog has to be under, under the understanding that only awesome things happen when we say this word. And what I mean by that is if your dog is doing something that it's really enjoying and then we're like, come here, come here, there's a good chance your dog's going to say, nah, I'm busy doing this great thing. What is the dog, you know, the dog is now under the impression, though, that when you call him, what you're doing is removing him from something he's enjoying. So, you know, a good one is dog's in the, you know, in the backyard and it's fenced in. Human goes out the back door, Fido, come here. Dog looks at human and says, no, you're going to pull me inside. I don't want to come inside. Well, in the long run, yes, we should be able to call our dog under any circumstance and they should come. But in the beginning, one of the huge mistakes that people make is trying to call their dog away from something it's enjoying. That kind of poisons the cue. That means basically the dog learns that coming when called isn't what it's cracked up to be. Not good, good things don't always happen. In fact, the removal of good things can happen, which gives them a good reason not to want to come when called. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I mean, there's other reasons too, but those are the ones I want to highlight. The, the biggest one I want to highlight is too much freedom. If you have a new dog and I'm going to get into this a little more here in a second, but you need to have your dog on a, on a long leash, whether it's a 20-foot leash, 30-foot leash, 50-foot leash, at all times when you're outside. That's going to mimic being off leash, but it gives you a backup system. And you want to do this for a couple weeks, depending on the dog, a month, a couple months, because we need to ensure that they do not do the opposite of coming when called when we ask them to come. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. So we're going to move on now to coming when called. How do we do it? Um, I like the picture I chose here. That's my dog, V. This is from a photo shoot that we did. And he's, if you look closely, you can't tell, but there's actually a giant spit bubble coming out of the side of his mouth. That's how much enjoyment he's coming, he's getting from coming when called. Um, anyway, sorry, I talked too much about my own dog. So, but how do we do it? Just like the, the walking on a loose leash, I like to introduce this behavior indoors. Realistically, once again, we should be the biggest distraction inside the house. We should be the greatest thing inside the house. Um, you know, except for like the first week or so when the dog's in the house. Everything's going to become old news to the dog, and we're going to be the most exciting thing. So I like to introduce it indoors. One thing that you can do is if your dog's in the other room, you can say, come here, Fido, come on, come on, come on. You know, and maybe not repeat yourself so much. That might be a bad habit. But, you know, get really into it. The dog's going to run over to you. Good dog reward. Practice that a lot. And so the dog gets used to hearing come, and then good things happening. And, and come is just the word I use. You can use any word that you choose. But you want to get them under the impression that when they hear the word come, they go to the human and they get awesome stuff. Um, the second bullet point is lots of treats, and I mean lots of treats. And once again, the Power Bites by Merrick, they're nice and small, and you can even break them in half, and I was doing that um, because they're soft. You know, they're not hard. You can break them in half, and they get them down the hatch quickly, and you can give them a lot. And there's, I think there's like three calories per. Um, I, don't, I don't have, actually, I have a bag right in front of me. Let me look. Do, 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 uh, five calories per. So, it's not, you know, an overwhelming amount, and especially if you're doing come on call, they're going to be burning calories as they go. But I want the dog to be so conditioned that when it hears come, good things happen. This brings me to my next point, and this is going to be something that you're going to want to do, um, and you have to be careful how you do this. This is what I refer to as double rewards, and I'm just going to give you an example of how I do a double reward system. Basically, uh, once the dog understands that coming to a human is a great thing, I like to start introducing taking the dog away from the thing that it was enjoying to come to me to get a reward to then go back to the thing it was enjoying. An example would be what we're doing in the picture here with my dog V. We're out hiking. We're actually doing the photo shoot. But when we go out hiking, I have him, you know, off leash in legal areas only, I swear. And he's running away. Not running away, you know, as to get away from me, but he's running away, having a ball, having a good time. I yell, come here, V. He then comes back to me. I give him a reward. And I say, okay, go away. And, and I literally say, okay, go away. And what I'm saying is go back to what you were doing. Go back and get another reward, which is enjoying what you were doing. 
this, if you can manage to get a double reward system when, with coming when called, you're going to have a ridiculously good um, cue of coming when called. The dog learns, oh, I go back to the human, I get something awesome, and then I go right back to what I was doing. This is a good way to convince a dog that coming when called is the greatest thing. And in the long run, like this is what I recommend doing if you have that dog in your backyard that won't come to you when you're trying to get it to come inside. What you need to do is start practicing going out there, calling them, rewarding them, telling them, okay, go away, and just work your way closer to your house. The ultimate goal is that you're going to be standing at your door. You're going to say, come here, Fido. Fido comes. You reward him, and you say, okay, go away. That's going to lead up to being able to call your dog inside your home, and you are ultimately going to end the fun sometimes, but it's not the end of the world because of the constant reinforcement. Under that, I have long leashes, and that I cannot stress the importance of a long leash enough. Seriously, go out and buy one. I just bought a couple 50 footers. You know, you can check your local stores. I got mine off of Amazon. It's 14 bucks for a 50 foot leash. It is the, one of the greatest training tools you can use. It gives the dog what feels like off leash freedom, but you have a backup system. And, you know, worst case scenario, if they start running away, well, they're dragging something that's 50 feet long, it gives you a little bit of hope in catching it. Ultimately, I don't recommend letting go of the other end of the leash until you're 100% confident that it's not going to roam too far. Um, so it's such a great tool. I don't really recommend using the retractable leashes. They're not the end of the world for coming when called. I just don't like them in general. I understand the convenience of them, but you can get some pretty nasty burns with those things on your ankles, and they can break and, and all that stuff. So I don't really recommend those. Um, and the, the next bullet point I have is introduce distractions. You know, if we don't ever, if we never introduce distractions to our dog, when we do come across a situation where there is a distraction and we haven't practiced it, well, good luck. I mean, you're not going to get your dog's attention, and you're not going to get them to come to you. So what I recommend doing is, in these training sessions, and I recommend doing a couple of 10-minute training sessions a day with just different behaviors, within those training sessions, you need to start grabbing some of your dog's favorite toys. Um, maybe you get some people around. And as you call your dog, I want other people to start clapping their hands. I don't want them to call your dog, but I want them to do some distraction work maybe run around a little bit. I want you to grab those toys and start kind of casually tossing them away and, and still encourage your dog to come to you. I just want your dog to be proofed against those tough distractions. I want you to start off with, uh, I recommend starting off with very easy distractions and then work with really, really hard distractions. You know, for some dogs, the hardest would be like a squirrel or, you know, another dog or something along those lines. I'm here to tell you, though, if you try, if you skip the work and you skip going with the easy stuff and then working way up to the harder stuff, if you skip that and just try to use it when there's a squirrel there, it's not going to work, or I highly doubt that it's going to work because you didn't take the right steps there. So introduce those distractions in moderation uh, and then increase their difficulty. Uh, like I said, with this long leash, though, you're talking, I mean, if I said six months on a long leash before you're ready to be off leash, that might not be an exaggeration. For some dogs, that might be as long as it takes. And the reason, and like I said, the reason is I don't use any punishment for this. So what you you know you have to manage your dog's reinforcers and if your dog gets in the habit of you say you know you say come here dog and the dog gets in the habit of going the other way well guess what we're teaching him basically that come here means go away I don't want you near me or you know to that extent so if we're teaching him that we're not really teaching him what we want so with that long leash you know worst case scenario if you have to reel them in you can do it I know a lot of people don't approve of that but I'm saying you know worst case scenario if you need to you can just gently ass assess or assist them in and typically just a little bit of, and I'm talking with your fingertips, you assist them and they go, oh, I know what that means, and then you can still reward them. Other options include running the opposite way. Um, you can kind of get their chase um, chase instinct to kick in. If you're going to do that, you have to be convincing, though. If you kind of just daintily run the other way, like flail your arms, the dog might look at you like you're an idiot. So you need to be convincing. You need to actually start running. Um, and that's another thing. You could even try sitting down or lying down, might throw your dog off, and they might come running to you. In fact, I highly recommend squatting to the ground, and you can even squat and turn away a little bit because that is less um, threatening, if you will. Your, your body language is more inviting. Uh, I also don't recommend yelling or anything. And one of the biggest things I just thought of, and I'm glad I thought of this, is a lot of people have a tendency to punish their dog for coming unintentionally. So just say your dog's in the garbage chewing on some stuff, and you say, bad dog, get over here, and the dog starts coming over to you, bad dog, bad dog, bad dog. Well, what you just did was you just punished your dog for coming to you. That is a big, big, big no-no, and I just sounded like a child there, but realistically, that's horrible. If you do that, you're teaching your dog that coming to you is horrible, and that's not what we want. We want our dog to think that coming to us is the greatest thing known to mankind. And like I said, this is very, very important. So don't let them lock that long leash until you're 100, you're 99% sure that they're going to come back every time. So 
just kind of summarize that again, introduce and endorse, and use lots of treats. I want the dog to think this is the greatest thing ever. Use that double reward system when it's time. That is going to be your best friend. You should see how fast my dog runs to me when we're off leash hiking when I call him. I mean, he's like the road runner or the, yeah, the road runner's fat, like the road runner from the old cartoons. He's there before you know it. Um, so use that double reward system when you can. It's going to be your best friend. And do not, and I mean, do not get off of that long leash before, you know, too soon. If you stop using treats too soon or you stop using the long leash too soon, you're going to ruin everything you worked hard for and your dog is not going to come when called. Um, and then don't forget to introduce those distractions. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, I think this is going to be the last. Here we go here. Soiling in the house, I believe. Yeah, this is number four. So this is the last one we're going to be talking about. I'm just going to run through this very quickly. Um, you can thank Brandy from the Dog in the Post for this awesome photo. And I have another one that's great coming after this. Sorry you have to look at that for so long. But I figured I would choose a good one. So why does this happen? Soiling in the house, why does this happen? It's pretty common for young dogs, you know, young puppies. And, and realistically, young puppies, they should. I wouldn't be surprised if you have a puppy that's four months old that's still doing this here and there. That doesn't sound wrong to me. I know it could still be frustrating, but mistakes still happen. But why is it happening? Well, first and foremost, the dog hasn't been taught the appropriate place to go to the bathroom. Um, basically, they haven't been taught that outside is the place to go, or they haven't been taught appropriately, you know, the right way that outside is the best place. Sometimes it's more comfortable inside. That might be what happens. Maybe it's storming outside and it's raining, and the dog's like, hey, I'm not going outside to poop. Why don't you go outside to poop? You know, and then they just go upstairs and and they go find a spot to poop because it's more comfortable. Uh, maybe they just couldn't hold it any longer. They just physically, they couldn't hold it in and it had to come out. And that's a pretty common one as well. One thing I like to point out is to our knowledge, what science is currently telling us is dogs don't have like a revenge, revenge to them, meaning they're not pooping to get back at us. Sometimes you hear people say, well, my dog uh, was mad at me because I didn't feed them enough. So to get back at me, he pooped you know, on the carpet or... My dog gets mad at me every day. I leave for work, and he poops every day in his cage. Um, you're looking more at something along the lines of he couldn't hold any longer or more, more along the lines of like a separation anxiety or something if your dog's pooping in the cage. But so that's a couple a couple little bullet points right there. Um, one thing, you know, I want to expel some old, old myths really quick. Moving on to the next slide. But I want to expel some old myths real quick. What I don't recommend doing is, you know, yelling at your dog if you catch them in the act. I don't recommend yelling. I don't recommend hitting them with a newspaper. That's kind of old school, but I'm sure some people are still doing it. I don't recommend yelling, hitting, uh, putting their nose in it. From from what we know, it just the dog isn't going to put it together. And it's just basically we're bringing an animal into our home, and we're, we need to teach it where to go to the bathroom is. And putting its nose in it, I don't think that's really fair. It's kind of gross too. But anywho, so I don't recommend doing that. And here's the reason why. At best, when you do something like that, your dog is going to learn that you and him and poop all in the same area equals no fun. So basically we have this, is it safe, is it dangerous? And the dog is going to learn, okay, it is, I'm just using the term dangerous loosely, but it is dangerous to poop when the human, like to poop and then have the human around it, bad things happen. So, you know, when we punish a dog like that, our thoughts are, okay, well, the dog's going to learn if you poop in the house, bad things happen. But I'm here to tell you, more often than not, what happens is the dog learns that pooping in front of the human is a bad thing. And I'm just using pooping as the, uh, as the thing, but, you know, peeing as well. Eliminating in general. They learn that eliminating in front of a human is a bad thing. Um, one reason that's bad for us is that makes it very challenging for us to teach them where the appropriate spot to eliminate is. And the other thing that this usually leads to is you'll have a dog that will go find places to eliminate where the human will not catch them in the act of doing it and will not find it at that time. So the dog will start eliminating behind couches, under couches, if they can fit, under beds, you know, in closets. They'll go to places where it can be hidden, where they feel like, well, basically they think it's still okay to poop in the house, they just can't do it in front of the human. And that is the most common thing that happens. So basically, if you catch your dog in the act of eliminating the house, my recommendation is you can kind of, I don't want to say startle them out of it, but you can say, no, 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 and try to grab them, and, and you can try to like interrupt it, but by all means, you don't want to do anything that teaches the dog that eliminating in front of you is a bad thing because that is going to make it very, very hard to teach them where to go appropriately. Um, so keep that in mind. So any of that old school stuff, uh, I don't recommend doing. So what do I recommend doing? That is a great question. Um, I have a couple bullet points here. Prevention, I have supervision, I have reinforcing the want of behavior, and I have get on a schedule. Prevention, what I mean by that is, you know, you can 
let me say this. If you have a dog and it's mentally healthy, meaning it's not dealing with any anxiety or anything like that, and it's old enough, in theory, you can put it into a place like a, like a crate, and as long as the crate is sized correctly, it will not eliminate in that crate. Um, if it's too big, the dog might eliminate in one side, and then it'll go hang out on the other side. But if it's the correct size, if you will, the dog is not going to eliminate in there because it's not going to want to sit in its own filth. Now, like I said, the only exception to this is if the dog literally just can't hold it any longer, and another exception is if the dog's dealing with, like, an anxiety, you can chalk that up. The dog is going to do it like crazy if it's dealing with anxiety, and it's probably going to be pretty nasty. Um, and that just goes to show you that the dog is not mentally in the right state of mind because if it was, it, was, it wouldn't do that. But so using something like a crate, you can use a playpen. And what I mean by a playpen is they make, like, um, I think it was an Octagon's eight-sided. or They, they make, like, six-sided um, playpens, and... If it's a young puppy, I'm not a big fan of pee pads, but you could stick like a pee pad in there to at least give them some sort of uh, place to go. Uh, you know, like if you if you do get a puppy and you're working eight hours a day, I would recommend doing something like a playpen so they can kind of do their own thing in there. And even still, if, you, if you're a single person and, and you're getting a puppy and you're working eight hours a day, it still might not be the best decision. But, you know, you could look into something like a playpen. But, but, but by using a playpen or a crate, you're doing something that's referred to as prevention and in theory, they won't make the incorrect decision. Now, the second bullet point is supervision, and this is so important. I mean, I can't even put enough emphasis on how important this is. When you have a young dog or a dog that's making this mistake, it is important that you know where that dog is at all times. One of the easiest ways, it can be kind of annoying, but one of the easiest ways to supervise your dog at all times is to tether them to your waist. Um, basically, you know, you take the leash, you put it around your belt, and the dog is permanently attached to you. That way you know where it, is, uh, where it is at all times. But as soon as you let that dog out of sight, I guarantee you that's when it's going to go have the accident. You're going to go, what the heck? And then we're kind of starting over. Once again, just like this, every other behavior we've spoken about so far, breaking the old habit is important. So I need to do, you know, if I'm doing my job correctly, the dog isn't making the mistakes. And in fact, if a mistake does happen, guess what? It's my fault. It's not the dog's fault. You have to have that mentality. As soon as you start blaming the dog, that's when it's not fair because you're bringing an animal into your home and you're expecting it to just adjust at the snap of a finger. It doesn't work like that. We need to take the time to train them. So that's where that supervision comes in. Um, but reinforcing the wanted behavior is by far the most important. I mean, what, they're, I would say they're all equally important because if you just do two, the third one, you need to do them all. But really reinforcing the wanted behavior is super important. That teaches them where they're supposed to go and it teaches them that awesome things happen when they go out there. Once again, I don't use any punishment for going in the wrong spot, so I need to teach them when you go outside, awesome things happen. I recommend getting some of those power bites out from Merrick, and what you do is when the dog, like as that last, um, excuse my French here, but as that last turd hits the ground, I go, good boy, one, two, and I'll pop him like three rewards, or as, like, as that last little drop of pee hits the ground, good boy, one, two, three, or if you're using the clicker training, you know, as that last um, thing hits the ground, you click and you treat, treat, treat. I recommend doing a couple of treats because I really want there to be emphasis on, hey, when you do that behavior, good things happen. Um, so that's kind of that really quickly in a nutshell. Um, get on a schedule, though. If you if They say for every month old that your puppy is, that's roughly an hour that it can hold its its bladder for or its, you know, its bowel movement. That's a general rule of thumb. That's not going to be true for every dog. Different things play into that. But So, for instance, if I think my dog can hold it for an hour, well, I'm not going to wait for an hour to let my dog out. I'm going to be doing like 50 minutes. Now that was 5-0, not 15. 50 minutes. Um, and then what I'm going to start doing is as the dog is getting older, I'm going to start physically, well not physically, but I'm going to start pushing him to hold it a little bit longer and a little bit longer. Some things that I'll do is say I know my dog can hold it for an hour and I know that he won't go in the crate, he won't eliminate in the crate. Well, I'll make him hold it for that hour. I'll then stick him in the crate. That sounds bad. I'll have him hold it for an hour. I'll stick him in the crate for about 10 minutes and then I'll let him directly outside to do his business. You can use that crate as a system to teach them how to hold it a little bit longer. And I'm not, this isn't like torturing your dog or anything like that. This is just being able to, it's like training them to, to hold on to their, their stuff a little bit longer. So that's important. Um, and then get on a strict schedule. I mean, if you're somebody that's home all day, every day, the more the merrier. You know, do every 45 minutes and then start spreading it out. Don't, uh, don't, don't uh, make the mistake of not letting them out enough. Let them know often, reward them a ton, and they'll start getting it under control. What you don't want to do, like I said, is not let them out enough. Then they start rehearsing that old, you know, the unwanted behavior. And like I said, as long as that unwanted behavior is there, it's probably always going to be there. So we need to break the old habit, create the new habit. 
Um, another thing that we can look into, and, I, and I'm kind of talking about young dogs, but really any dog could potentially still be having this issue. But what we can do is regulate when they eat and drink. I'm a big fan of scheduled feedings, meaning you feed them twice to three times a day. If you can, if you know when it's going in, you have a better idea of when it's going to come out. And that is in comparison to a dog that has a full bowl of food all the time, because you don't know when it's necessarily going in. So that means it could come out at any time. So regulate that. Um, you know, I give water more often than I give food, and but I do regulate water intake as well. I, you know, dogs that are not trained to pee outside have a tendency to overhydrate themselves because they do not have a reason not to. Meaning, they can just drink all the water in the world and then they'll just pee anywhere because there's no reason not to. So regulate that as well. Um, go and one other thing too in regards to, um, I just had a brain fart there. I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh well, I'm sure it'll come back to me. But, so put that all together. Um, I wish I could remember what I was just going to say. Oh, well, it'll come back to me probably when we finish here. But So get on that schedule um, and, and just do it often. And, and just do whatever you can to eliminate those mistakes. I know this is a tough one. The older the dog is and the longer that it's been rehearsing the behavior, in theory, the longer it's going to take to fix. So try to get on a strict schedule right away and start, uh, start working on it. So. I think that's all I want to say about how to soil in that or how to prevent it, but I'm just going to summarize that real quick. So prevention is huge because if we're preventing properly, the dog is not making the mistake. Once again, supervision is huge because if we're supervising correctly, the dog is not making the mistake. And reinforcing that wanted behavior is humongous because that teaches them where to go. Once again, to summarize what not to do, I don't recommend sticking their face in it. I do not recommend yelling at them. I do not recommend hitting them, all that stuff. That's going to ruin, ruin your relationship with your dog, in my opinion, and it's also, it doesn't really teach them what they're supposed to do. With everything that I've said so far, we want to focus on teaching them what they're supposed to do. And I'm sorry, my dog's scratching, so you can probably hear him in the background. But focus on what you want them to do and reinforce that behavior. That is going to give you the quickest results that you are, the, quick, the quickest results that you can find. Um, so I'm just going to stop talking about soiling now. I'm going to move on to my next slide, which I believe is my final slide, and that is where to find me. Here I am. I'm actually in North Carolina with V in the Blue Mountains. You can't usually find me there. Uh, that was a vacation, but I thought it was a cool picture. But you can find me on Facebook at my Facebook page, All Dogs Go to Kevin LLC. I give a lot of free tips on there, and I post a lot of my videos. Um, you can find me on my website at dogstokevin.com. That's, um, once again, I give a lot of free information on there, a lot of free videos. You can find me on YouTube if you search Kevin Duggan, CPDD, uh, CPDT, slash KA. Um, it's a, I have a different name as well. It sounds silly, but I created it when I was younger. It's good K, hey, hey. That's kind of what it's under. You might have to type that in. I did, was too embarrassed to put it on here, so I just ended up saying it anyway. Um, and then you have twitter.com. Dogs to Kevin is another place to find me. Once again, I get a lot of good information out on there. And on my YouTube channel, I have videos on just about everything we've talked about so far. So if a lot of you are like me, you're pretty good at visually learning things. So that might be very, very helpful for you. Um, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, and you'll get automatic updates when new videos come out because I do those often. And come September with my Facebook page, I'll start doing daily tips again. I usually do a tip of the day every day from, you know, basic obedient or basic, you know, manners to dealing with different issues like that. Um, and then one last thing, don't forget next week, a week from today at the same exact time, we are doing another webinar, and we're going to be talking about training rescue dogs with treats. Um, even if you don't have a rescue dog, I'm going to be touching upon a lot of common behavior issues that you often see with rescue dogs. And I'm not, there's nothing wrong with rescue dogs. Don't take it like that. But just common things that dogs deal with when they're kind of, you know, in sheltered living for a while. And we're going to talk about how to help them out. And these common issues could very easily be something that you're dealing with as well. I'm going to be talking about socialization. I'm going to be talking about I mentioned briefly the classical conditioning and the counter conditioning. So if your dog has reactivity issues, if it likes to bark at other dogs, people, um, bark at cars, et cetera, et cetera, I'm going to be covering all that, how to fix or how to, you know, how to address that. And once again, it's going to be about, you know, doing it while using treats. We're not going to use any pain. We're not going to use any fear. And I've had a lot of success with it. So I am going to stop talking because I talk a lot and I'm going to cut myself off now. Um, I believe Harlan, you're going to take over again real quick. You with me still? Hello. <laughs> Anybody hear me? Well, I'm going to back out of this screen. Hey, everybody. It's Harlan. <laughs> yeah, I had to turn on my mic because of uh, a, a little puppy that likes making noise. Um, 
so first of all, Kevin, thanks for an outstanding presentation. And we'd like to make sure that we cover any questions. I'm not seeing questions. So folks, if you've got any questions, um, put them in before we see who is paying attention and is going to win the prize today. So if there are no questions, and I don't see any, um, oh, we just got one. OK. Hey, Kevin. Hi. <laughs> any tips on handling the situation where you're on lead dog is approached by one or more off lead dogs with owners too far behind and you know this isn't going to end well. Do you pick up your dog where if you can or do you put yourself in between your dog and the other dogs, shout, run for it, etc.? <clears throat> that's a great question and that's a tough one. Um, you know, I'm just going to give you one example. One of the easiest things that we can do is we can go to the store and we can purchase what's called spray shield. I'm not a fan of doing anything that's going to hurt a dog, but my safety and my dog's safety is the most important thing. What spray shield is, it's a um, it's citronella that's condensed. And what that's going to do is it's basically a deterrent. It sprays up about up to 10 feet. Um, so if a dog is charging you and you're worried about your safety or your dog's safety, you can spray it in their direction, and that can get them to back off. We can train our dogs to get behind us, um, and, and to be completely honest, and I'm going to be completely honest here, I will do anything that's going to potentially save myself or save my dog. Um, you know, those are two very important things to me. Once again, my goal is not to hurt the dog or anything like that, but I will do whatever I have to to safely get out of the situation. You know, I have heard you can try doing things like asking the dog to sit. There's a chance that it might sit. I know that might sound silly, but hey, it's worth a shot. You can try shouting. You could try running at it, but I mean, really, my goal is not to make it any more aggressive. You know, I'm not, you know, say it is being aggressive. That's just a loose term, but my goal isn't to make it any worse than it already is. But realistically, the spray shield is a little, a little like, I think it's like an eight ounce can that you can spray up to about 10 feet. And most dogs, that's going to be a good enough deterrent. It's not going to do any serious damage to the dog. It's just something that they're not going to like. Um, I don't really recommend using mace or anything like that. That's going to, or pepper spray, that'll hurt the dog, but. Uh, so that's a quick little, so that's a you know an easy one. That, that's a really tough question. Uh, I, my recommendation is do whatever you have to do for your own safety and for your dog's safety. Kind of go from there. I mean, picking up your dog could be, you know, yeah, I mean, depending on the size of the dog, you could pick it up. Um, but I think spray shield is the easiest thing that you could, uh, that still allows you to have space in between you and that dog. And to be honest, you know, that might make the people upset, but, you know, if they don't have control over their dog, they shouldn't have them off leash. And, you know, so it's kind of a broad answer, but that's kind of the best I can give you at the moment. Good question. Um, we have, uh, can't wait until next week. I'm a volunteer dog walker for my local shelter and work with those dogs that are far more difficult slash untrained. I love them, but would love any tricks you may have. You were awesome. <laughs> Oh, hey there, great talk. How soon can we get this up and shared, and can you forward the link for next week's webinar? You will be able to find that link on the Doggington Post page. You'll be able to find it on the Merrick Pet Care page, all over Twitter and Instagram. Next question. What would you do with a strong-minded retriever who knows his commands, sit, stay, come, but he has very selective hearing and literally tunes me out if I don't suit him? That's a good question, and that's a very common question. <clears throat> it's one of the most frustrating things for people is when, you know, they're under the understanding, and, and I understand where this is coming from, but they're under the understanding that their dog knows what is being asked of it, and it's choosing not to do it. So I understand that completely, and, and it can be very frustrating. I choose to have the mindset that, you know, when I ask a dog to do something, I expect it to do it every time. Um, so that's what the cue means to me. So when I say come, I expect the dog to come every time, et cetera, et cetera. And so the way I look at it is if the dog is not doing it, that means it doesn't fully understand what I'm asking. So I know that sounds kind of vague, but because if it fully understood, that means it would do it every time. In a situation like that, I kind of I figuratively and maybe even literally take a step back, and I, I go one step earlier with my training, and I'll step it up with whatever I have to do to get the dog to start coming more frequently. Um, you know, say just coming as an example, if you start re rewarding um, the better response times, that's what you'll typically start getting. 
So if you, you know, the dog, if you say calm, the dog calms, it takes five seconds. The next time you say calm, it takes two seconds. Give extra rewards for that two-second response time, and you'll see an increase, or you'll see an increase of faster response times. Uh, but your comment is question, it's very frustrating. Believe me, I understand, and I get it all the time. But my recommendation is just kick the training into overdrive and kind of, you know, if this is happening, you're probably in an environment that's challenging. Maybe go back to an environment that's easier, really work hard, and then come back to that environment that's more challenging, and then do the same things you just did in the other environment. Just kind of like start over. So get the treats out, do some luring if you have to. Believe me, I know it's frustrating, but sitting there and repeating yourself over and over again, if the dog doesn't do it, then that's not changing anything. So I will get that treat out, and I will lure them to a sit, even if I know that they know what sit means. Um, and I'll just start teaching them that, hey, no, no matter what I ask, no matter where you are in whatever time it is, when I ask you to do it, you still have to do it. So just because we're using treats in, you know, in a positive style of training doesn't mean they're allowed to get away with whatever they want. It just means that's what the emphasis is on, but we still have rules and everything like that. So it's frustrating, but just keep up, you know, keep working hard on it, take a few steps back, and, and you should start to see some success. And try not to get frustrated. I know it's hard not to, but... Okay, um, next question. My dog goes crazy and barks a lot when I play with my kids in the front yard and while she's either inside or in the backyard. Is there a way to help her relax so that I can ride bikes with my kids while she's alone? You know, this could be, you know, dealing with, like, some isolation distress or, you know, maybe a low level of separation anxiety. It could be that the dog just wants to be included and, um, you know, it's just not being included. And one thing that you could do is train it. Um, to just kind of hang out and good things happen when it hangs out. So say you're playing with your kids, you look at the dog and you say, good dog for not, um, you know, not barking, you toss it a treat, you start positively reinforcing that behavior. Basically you're giving it something to do. Um, you know, my assumption, I'm kind of trying to picture this here, but you're probably, you know, your dog maybe is tethered to something and then you're a couple feet away and the dog wants to be included. So that's, um, that's just what I'm kind of assuming here. I might be wrong, but, um, my goal would be, you know, maybe give it something to do, like, um, a, you know, something that you could stick some tasty treats in, and you can put it on the ground so the dog does some, like, auto-shaping. You could do something along those lines. Um, or you could just casually toss treats for the correct behavior. I, I like to work hard on the basics, like sitting and lying down. So if my dog's acting silly like that, I can say, no, nope, lie down. Dog lies down, and I can say, good dog, and I can start rewarding that wanted behavior. So, you know, it's kind of a, a broad answer, but... Whenever your dog's doing something like that, think about, okay, what would I like my dog to do instead, and then train that behavior. So I'd rather have my dog, you know, lie down, or I'd rather just have my dog kind of hang out and be cool. Well, I want to start figuring out how I can re reward that behavior and reinforce that behavior. So that's that's a good way to look at it, though. Figure out what you want and then start rewarding those behaviors. Okay. Next question. I have a Jack Russell Terrier mix, very reactive to other dogs. After two and a half years... He can finally pass the dog on the other side of the street by focusing on me treat. What are the chances that will be okay pa on passing a dog on the same side of the sidewalk? How do I up the ante for this? Okay, I'm going to give you like a short answer because this is something I'm really going to be addressing um, next week. But basically what we want to do is start very slowly decreasing the distance between your dog and the other dog. So if you go from, if you're, say you're walking down the street and there's a sidewalk on each side of the street, your dog is now successfully passing dogs sidewalk to sidewalk like that, we now want to slowly get closer to that dog. So maybe, um, and I'm doing a visual in my mind here, but maybe you get out from the sidewalk, you get on the very edge of the, very edge of the road that's still furthest away from that dog, you try to successfully pass the dog from that distance, and then you slowly, I mean, you obviously have to use a road here that isn't uh, full of traffic because you're getting hit by a car, and that's not what I'm telling you to do here. But uh, you know, get closer and closer gradually. You could even do this at a park where you could gradually get closer and closer. Uh, ultimately, though, my goal is to teach the dog to look at the other dog and get rewarded for looking, with you know, without reacting. And my uh, my other goal is to, if I need to, I can just say, hey, leave it. Meaning, dog's looking at the other. You, my dog is looking at the other dog, and I can just say, hey, leave that other dog. Look back at me and get good stuff. That's kind of um, and it. That's kind of the answer in a nutshell. Like I said, I'm going to dive into that a lot deeper next week and talk about distance and duration and, and all that kind of good stuff. So, but. Okay. Um, how do you stop a dog from eating poop? <laughs> well, first off, um, 
if you never stop them, then you never have to pick up poop, right? <laughs> no, that's not the best answer. But, um, you know, uh, Dr. Chris, who, who writes for the uh, Doggington Post as the Ask the Vet, he, somebody recently asked him that question, and, you know, from his knowledge, what he said was, we need to address this as a behavioral issue and not a medical issue. I've kind of read around that some other vets do say it's medical, but for, for, um, for safety's sake, however, for easy sake, we're just going to say that it's behavioral. The very first and easiest thing that we can do is pick it up as it's coming out. That way we can break the old habit. Um, secondly, what we can do is we can work very, very hard on a leave it cue. So <laughs> ironically, what you'll do is you'll find poop in the yard. You'll walk your dog kind of close to it. You're going to cue him to leave it. Once he leaves it, you're going to reward him with a treat, and then you'll get closer and closer to it, and you'll start doing that. Ultimately, if your dog is in the back, I'm just using this as an example. If your dog is in the backyard by itself unattended, good luck. Um, you probably won't be able to get your dog to stop eating poop. But if you are out there with him, we can work on things like a leave it cue, and we can start reinforcing the wanted behavior. So um, if I'm really not a fan of dogs outside by themselves, but if that's something that's going on, just I would say pick up all the poop prior uh, and, you know, if you are out there with them, I would work heavy on a, heavily on a Leave It cue. I do have uh, a video on my YouTube channel on Leave It, and then I actually have another one on how to leave your food alone. Granted, your food isn't obviously poop, but you can watch that too and get an idea of how to incorporate Leave It in other aspects as well. So it's definitely a tough one. All right. Um, we, have, we have reached the end, and now we are ready for our question of the day. I'm just going to suggest to you that for those of you who are serious about uh, winning, get your fingers on the keyboard because the first person with the correct answer wins. But the question and answers aren't over now. No, no, no. Um, Kevin will be heading over to... Um, Facebook.com Merrick Pet Care to continue the conversation and you can ask your questions if there are any questions that did we lost in the question field here um, you can ask your questions over there and Kevin will answer them so the first person to answer this question correctly will receive four bags of Merrick Power Bites one of each flavor and Merrick will donate four bags to a rescue of your choice so here's what Here's the question. A dog pulls against his leash, leash in part due to what reflex? I know, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, Linda Gregor. Woo. Followed by Jenna. Linda, you were there a, a fraction of a sec, second. God, you guys are fast. Uh, Jenna, you'll have to try and take it from her next week. The answer is opposition. You are our winner. If you would send us an email, Linda, at info at doggingtonpost.com, uh, info at doggingtonpost.com, we will, uh, and send us your address and the name of your local sh shelter. We'll get that over to Merrick, who will get your treats uh, on the way to you. And... Um, and you will have um, one happy fur kid, or more than one happy fur kid. Um, I know that Mike Kalba thinks that those bags are all to be eaten at one time, but we're kind of discussing that, and um, I don't agree. Anybody, thanks to our good friends at Merrick, uh, because the best dog ever deserves the best food ever, and the best dog deserves Merrick. So. Folks, let's um, uh, go ahead and sample it, uh, especially we're focusing on those treats. And we will be back next week with Kevin on, um, on training rescue dogs. That's going to be really big. Make sure you're here. Tell your friends. And until next time, follow us on all the places. Everybody have a great night. Bye.